All right, it looks like we've been joined by another large contingent this evening. Uh, so welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Keegan Shetland. I'm the director of the Military Aviation Museum. Tonight, we're gonna to take a deep dive into an amazing event you might have read about last year, uh, the return to Normandy by a number of C-47s operated as warbirds based here in the United States. Um, it's truly a, an incredible thing to have observed. And we have with us here tonight, Eric Zipkin, who was uh, one of the chief organizers of this endeavor and also pilot of the airplane Placid Lassie, which was itself a D-Day veteran C-47. Without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Zipkin, pilot of the C-47 Placid Lassie. Uh, he is also the president of the Tunison Foundation, which he'll tell us a little bit about, uh, that owns and operates the aircraft. But um, in his private life, uh, Eric also owns an airline. So we are actually catching him at kind of a busy time where he's been working to save his business. So we have to extend him a, a great debt of gratitude for spending his evening with us tonight uh, to kind of look back over this incredible accomplishment that was bringing all these C-47s safely to Europe, participating in the 75th anniversary commemorations of D-Day, and then returning them safely back to the United States. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Eric, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Keegan. Um, sorry, slight technical uh, technical challenge here. And thank you everyone for uh, for getting on the web webinar. Uh, I have a little bit of a confession to make. This is the uh, the first time that I've done a webinar as a presenter. So um, uh, please bear with me, and I will try not to uh, bore you uh, too terribly much. Uh, as Keegan mentioned, I had the privilege of leading an organization called the D-Day Squadron, uh, which was a group of um, ultimately 15 C-47 slash DC-3 aircraft that uh, gathered in the United States and went over to Europe for the uh, to not only commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day, but also the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. Um, as, as Keegan mentioned, I'm in the uh, in the aviation business by my profession. And uh, it was kind of a long and winding road of how we got here. Um, let's see. So, like I said, the mission was to sell, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of, D of the D-Day invasion, and then also to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we get to get further on. How did it happen? Um, as I said, I was I'm in the aviation industry and uh, had a friend of mine who's also a passionate aviator called me up one day and said, uh, I've gone and bought a DC-3, uh, would you like to fly it? And I thought about that for about a nanosecond and uh, decided, well, of course I'd like to go fly the airplane. And I figured it was just gonna be kind of a, a fun thing to do and, and learn to fly the DC-3. Well, it turned out that I was presented with an uh, airplane that was, ultimately become known as Placid Lassie, or actually had originally been known as Placid Lassie, um, and then would be, get back to her original colors. We found Lassie 2010 in a, in a uh, boneyard in northern, um, uh, northern uh, uh, Georgia, and proceeded to get her flying uh, and take her to Oshkosh for the 75th anniversary of the DC-3 type. The original plan had been to just fly Lassie to Oshkosh and sell her off to a, um, a freight operator where she would go on to um, haul, lot, haul, haul a bunch more freight uh, to the rest of the, uh, throughout the, throughout the country. But it turned out as we were doing our research about Lassie, um, it turned out that Lassie was actually a D-Day veteran airplane. Uh, she was born, she was built, I see I say, almost say born, because uh, she is kind of part of the family. Uh, but she was built in 1942 and delivered to the uh, Army Air Corps as a C-47 and uh, went over to Europe uh, with, um, um, in, in 1943 and early, 19, or nor, early 1944 as uh, part of the 74th Troop, Troop Carrying Squadron and ultimately participated uh, towing a glider in the initial wave of the D-Day invasion. So when we found out that Lassie um, had participated, we decided that it would be kind of an ignominious fate for, um, for Lassie to go back to hauling freight. Uh, the most recent freight was uh, day-old chicks up and down the East Coast 
from uh, uh, New Hampshire all the way down through the Carolinas and into Georgia. And uh, we decided to uh, hold on to her and, and restore her and get her uh, back to her original colors. And that's what we did. Um, we started flying her and really learning about her history. But in 2014, I got a phone call from a guy by the name of Peter Braun, who's organizing the 70th anniversary um, of the of um, of D-Day and the commemoration of that. And they were looking for airplanes that were in original colors and that were set up to do parachute jumping to go to um, Europe and participate in the 70th anniversary. And again, a little bit on the lark, um, didn't really know what we were getting into, but I said, yeah, sure, let's do it. So in 2014, we flew last year across the Atlantic and participated um, in the 70th anniversary uh, celebrations. It was an extraordinary experience, probably warranting its own uh, presentation and own webinar. But uh, the most important thing is that we got over to, to Europe and there, were only, there was only one other airplane that came from the United States that was Whiskey 7. And I said to myself, you know, we, meaning the United States, were an integral part of liberating the world, if not, and, 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 and here we are at an extraordinary, extraordinarily important anniversary, and the best we can muster is two airplanes. And I said, when we got back after 2014, I said, when we come back for the 75th anniversary, we're going to come back with an entire squadron of airplanes. Uh, a lot of people kind of laughed at that and uh, thought thought it was uh, a, um, a pipe dream. And in many ways, it was about a pipe dream. But in uh, 2017, we launched the effort to bring, which the effort which would ultimately become known as the D-Day Squadron, to bring the airplanes, bring a full squadron of C-47s across the Atlantic and, um, and commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And that's what we did. This little slide here talks a little bit about D-Day, and uh, um, I know most of you are very, very passionate about uh, about aviation and military aviation, especially World War II aviation. So most of this information is kind of, I'm sure, is, is, a, is a bit redundant. What's important, though, is that it's not redundant for most people. This is kind of a recurring theme about why we did this and how we did it, is that the generation of people not only the people, the, the World War II veterans that participated in, in the war, they're rapidly um, dying off. But even those that are only one generation removed from a World War II veteran are rapidly dying off. So we have a responsibility as, uh, as enthusiasts and as a group to make sure that the people who don't have a personal connection to World War II really understand the context of what World War II was in general and specific, especially uh, important uh, events like D-Day. So we put together a squadron. Um, at one point in time, it was corresponding with about 50 different um, um, uh, aircraft teams throughout the United States. There were a lot of people who were very interested in going. Some um, were better equipped than others, and some were, um, you know, were, were better financed than, than others. But ultimately, we ended up with uh, just about 15 airplanes. Probably the most famous of with, which, of course, is That's All Brother with CAF. Placid Lassie, which is my airplane. Um, I say my airplane. Uh, Placid Lassie is actually operated by the Tunison Foundation. And a little side note, um, Tunison Foundation, the name Tunison is named after Ed Tunison, who was the radio operator of Placid Lassie in World War II. When we went over to Europe in 2014, um, a very enthusiastic Dutch, uh, Dutch man came up to me when we landed, first landed in Normandy, and he said very frantically, I know your airplane, I know your airplane. And I said, well, yes, it's a C-47. He says, no, 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 I know your airplane. Here's a picture of it. And this was the first time that we knew that our airplane was called Placid Lassie. It was the aircraft that was on the cover of the unit history. So we had wartime pictures of Placid Lassie. Furthermore, so we now knew that our airplane had a name. Um, furthermore, um, this fellow, uh, Hans is his name. Hans says, I know the crew. 
I said, well, that would be, be wonderful. I'd love to correspond with their families. He says, no, no, no. I know the crew. Ed Tunison is alive and well in Palm Springs, California. So I sent an email almost immediately, and he responded very, very, very quickly. And uh, the team that we had put together to go bring the airplane over to Europe uh, was unanimous that we would put Ed Tunison on an airliner if he was up for it, put him on an airliner and fly him to Europe to fly with us which is exactly what we did. So I had the privilege, very rare privilege of flying uh, Lassie in, uh, in Europe, over Holland especially, uh, with Ed Tunison. So when, when he passed away and we decided to operate uh, Lassie in perpetuity, we, um, we named the foundation after Ed. Um, so continuing on through the, the, um, the, the you know, it's, the, the, the D-Day squadron was made up of kind of an eclectic mix of, of airplanes. Uh, Screaming Eagle out of Oshkosh, Wisconsin is owned by a Swiss uh, billionaire who is just enthusiastic about, uh, about the aircraft. Uh, Betsy's Biscuit Bomber is a nonprofit out of Paso Robles, California. D-Day Doll is another CAF airplane. All of these airplanes here uh, were, and all the airplanes with, uh, with stars are actual D-Day veteran airplanes. Uh, Miss Montana, you guys may have heard a little bit about Miss Montana. She was kind of the underdog of the entire operation, an airplane that had been in static display at the Museum of Mountain Flying in Missoula, Montana, when a group of uh, volunteers decided to get her together and fly her to Europe. Um, a lot of people thought that that couldn't be done, but they, uh, they had an enormous amount of stick to and dedication, and, and they made it there. Um, Pan Am out of Seattle, Washington. Legend Airways out of Denver, Colorado, uh, gorgeously restored uh, aircraft that has um, D-Day history. Virginia Ann out of Newport Beach, California. The Flaybob Express, which you guys probably, if you've been to Oshkosh, you see the Express there every year. And uh, let's see, the Spirit of Anovia. Interesting, the Spirit of Anovia, you'll notice there that it's painted in the Civil Air Transport colors. Spirit of Anovia was, uh, flew the hump in World War II, and uh, uh, um, as an aircraft for China, for uh, for CNAC, Chinese National Airline Company Corporation, and um, we'll talk about it a little bit later on. But uh, we were introduced to one of her original pilots, again a guy by the name of uh, Pete Gautier, who um, lives in Maine and flew the hump, flew 600 missions, actually as a civilian flying over the hump in that actual airplane. And we had the privilege of meeting him just before we went off to Europe. And, um, and he got, he was reunited with his, with his airplane. Uh, Miss Virginia, uh, uh, happenstance out of Oakland, California, 18121 out of Aurora, or or Oregon, and the Clipper Tabitha May out of Manassas, uh, Manassas, Virginia. And that was the D-Day squad. We started off, um as the um uh, as as many organizations do it was an enormous logistical challenge it really was about getting everybody together on the same page and understand what we needed to do and the there really were two parts of the project to get to europe one was to actually get all the airplanes uh mechanically sound and the crews uh, qualified to be able to fly the aircraft uh, effectively. Um, but then we also, once we're in Europe, we we're going to be flying together. And so we needed to learn how to fly together as a, a true squadron, as a, as a military unit. And so our first event was actually the AOPA, uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, 80th anniversary fly-in in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, AOPA had been a very, and ha continues to be a staunch supporter of the D-Day squadron. And they really helped us get the word out um, to and, and 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 generate an enormous amount of support. So as a as a thank you and also an opportunity to work together, we, the the 80th anniversary flying was our first flying uh, event together as a squadron. We had six aircraft together, and we did um, not only um, we did a formation flyover of the Washington Monument, and then we did our first formation parachute operations. One of the things historically. The C-47s uh, are best known in D-Day for airborne operations, for supporting the airborne operations, made famous by uh, a band of brothers. Um, and that is 
largely what the C-47s do in the air show and in the commemoration world is, is supporting commemorative parachute drops. So we supported a number of groups throughout the world um, in those um, uh, reenacting parachute drops, which are done just like they were in, um, in World War II uh, with static line and round canopy. And um, uh, of course, nobody's shooting at you, so it's a little bit easier than, uh, than it was back then. Um, afterwards, we decided we, had, we were going across the Atlantic. So we did um, several days of training to work together. And you can see it's kind of a fun picture of us all learning to put on our Gumby suits. Um, the uh, Gumby suit is, a, is, a, is an exposure suit for if you were to end up in the, uh, uh, in the water of the North Atlantic. Uh, a lot of us didn't have a lot of uh, hope as to what might happen should we uh, end up in the Atlantic. But we had a, a very dedicated volunteer, a guy by the name of uh, Kevin Riley. And uh, Kevin's a, uh, a current active duty uh, uh, Coast Guard airman. And uh, previously he was a Black Hawk, an Army Black Hawk pilot. And uh, he conducted this training, um, and survival training, and it gave us a little bit of hope that uh, if we did end up in the water, um, if we were properly equipped and we followed his instructions, we would uh, someday be rescued. That having been said, we were also made aware of the fact that there are no search and rescue um, uh, assets in the North Atlantic uh, that are anywhere nearby. So we could expect to sit in the raft for somewhere, somewhere around four days before the Danish Navy would be able to come out and get us. So that was also a little bit of a, of a sobering, uh, sobering thought. Part and parcel of this, this was um, the, the training event was based in Oxford, Connecticut, which is my home. And uh, we put the group, we put the squadron together. And as a kickoff, we flew the Hudson River Corridor and flew around the Statue of Liberty as a, as a large group. And then ultimately, it was time for us to kick off. You can see a little bit of a stylized map, but we followed the, the, the same North Atlantic route that we that was followed in um, uh, in World War II. Inter I, I like to joke that they haven't moved any of the spots, and uh, the, the um, and 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 those spots, those stops, stopping off points that were used in World War II, are still ideal, the ideal and the most efficient ways to get a piston aircraft across the North Atlantic and back. So we departed out of Oxford, Connecticut, which is just outside of New York City. To Goose Bay, Newfoundland, uh, then on to Narsarswak. If you've ever read um, Fate is the Hunter, it's uh, Bluey West One, is also what it's known as. And from Narsarswak to Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, and then on to Prestwick, Scotland, and then uh, further on into southern England, Duxford, and then ultimately into France. One of the most important things that we did in our planning is to build in a lot of time. The biggest unknown um uh, in 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 the entire operation was the weather and the only real way to or the, the most effective way to deal to deal with that unknown is to build a lot of time into your schedule so that if the weather's bad you can sit and you can wait it out a couple things you can see preparations on the inside of the aircraft two very very critical things on the left you can see that uh, it's a light raft properly secured by the door, should you actually need it. And then no less important is the toilet facilities that we needed to have on the airplane. We flew some long, long days, especially the, the goal was to wait for our weather window going across the North Atlantic and then just fly as, um, as much as we absolutely could to try to take advantage of that weather window and not run the risk of getting stuck somewhere. So, um, most of the C-47s, especially the ones in military, um, uh, kind of back in the military configuration, don't have very much for uh, facilities. So a five gallon pail and a, and a toilet seat was, uh, works quite well. Greenland. Um, so like I said, we started off out of Oxford. We continued on to Goose Bay. And Greenland is kind of the, or Narsarswak, is really one of the most storied spots for the North Atlantic crossing. Um, it's very, it's an extraordinarily remote part of the world. 
and the weather is very unpredictable. And the airports, you can see the Narsarswak Airport on the picture on the right there, are usually um, on a flat piece of land at the end of a fjord. So we had a gorgeous day getting into uh, Narsarswak, and uh, we flew up and we were able to see the terrain. But if you have a bad weather day, what you have to do is you fly the airplane down at low altitude, down along the surface of the water, up the fjord, and the fjord ends with that airport that's already on, that's there on the right, assuming you choose the correct fjord. In this day and age, we had probably, we had more GPSs than, uh, than, than you could ever imagine on the airplane, two onboard GPSs, then everybody's got their iPhone and a portable and this, that, and the other thing. There was very little risk that we were gonna end up going up the wrong fjord. During the war, however, the only way to identify the correct fjord when the weather was bad, and remember these were 200 hour pilots uh, with almost no experience, uh, was by a radio beacon that was uh, erected at the end, uh, end of the fjord. The Germans were kind of sneaky though. They put a U-boat um, at the beginning of a, another fjord and oftentimes turned on the beacon. And the problem is, is you fly up the fjord when the weather's down, and you go up the wrong fjord, there's no runway at the end of it, and then you can't turn around and uh, with kind of predictable consequences. Fortunately, this is the Reykjavik, this is sorry, the Narsarswak Airport. You can see it is pretty lonesome, pretty desolate. Uh, there's not much there except for fuel. Uh, one of our big challenges getting across the Atlantic was that it takes about an hour and a half to fuel each C-47. So as a squadron, we split up and we uh, we did um, four airplanes on the first day, uh, five or six airplanes on the five, sorry, five airplanes on the second day, and then a few of the other uh, squadron airplanes. Uh, there were a couple that left early, and then several more uh, followed in the days to, days to follow. So ultimately, after um, going across the north of the Atlantic, we based our squadron. Um, at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford, England. Uh, those of you who may have heard uh, about Duxford and about the collection of US military aircraft that is in, if you look at the picture on the bottom right there, that domed hangar. Duxford was also the welcoming spot for all of our aircraft and all of the other aircraft that were gonna participate in the 75th uh, anniversary of, uh, of D-Day commemorations. So while we were there, we had we 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 made it across the Atlantic in I won't say record time, but a lot more quickly than originally expected. So we had a bunch of time in in Duxford, and uh, we were invited by um, Shuttleworth, which is the or the um, the, the Shuttleworth collection, which is another uh, antique airplane um, collection um, uh, just nearby, to come for a barbecue. And so we did, we had actually, we took seven of the squadron aircraft, we flew out as a flight and um, went to Shuttleworth for a day to enjoy landing on grass and, um, and, and an extraordinary collection of, 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 uh, of 1930s, of, of, of uh, actually of, of wartime and pre-war aircraft. Shuttleworth is most well known for its collection of um, uh, aircraft from the, from the teens kind of the Edwardian time period. You can see a couple of pictures of, you know, Duxford is uh, well known as, uh, has, a, has an extraordinary history as an airbase, and many of the buildings that existed during World War II um, that supported uh, the, uh, the, the, the military units that flew out of Duxford um, are still, still remain. The other thing near Duxford is Cambridge, and we had the we had the uh, the opportunity to explore Cambridge, ex including the um, uh, the a pub, the um, name of which now escapes me right now, but uh, the Eagle Pub, thank you, um, that is in downtown Cambridge, and it's a pub that existed during World War II, and it was a favorite haunt of fighter pilots. And the fighter pilots would go into one of the rooms and they would paint their name on the ceiling with a cigarette lighter. 
So the you see the picture on the right there is the name of World War II aviators who had gone to the pub at the at the Eagle to have a pint or two and left their mark uh, in the in the roof in the ceiling of that building. Really one of the many different spots along the way where we were really walking in the uh, in the footsteps of giants, in the footsteps of 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 the history in the exact same spot, the same exact same spot, seventy five years earlier, where um, where young young men had uh, um, had gone to war, and um, and in many cases not come back. Um, this is kind of a bit of a famous picture. We we um, in England as we were preparing, we uh, we did we started we continued to practice our formation flying. And uh, did a number of uh, photo uh, photo missions, including this one um, in front of the cliffs of Dover. We also joined up with the um, European squadron of aircraft. We had nine aircraft, and it was uh, turned into a very international uh, international group. Uh, aircraft from France, several aircraft from the UK, um, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, uh, Finland. Netherlands, and uh, for those of you who really are into your eclectic DC-3 interesting uh, uh, history, the world's only flying Lysanov Li-2, which was a Russian-built uh, copy of the DC-3, um, and um, and then uh, a Norwegian aircraft. The Norwegian aircraft actually was the only aircraft to suffer a mechanical um, uh, failure during this entire uh, or any major mechanical failure, they had an engine failure while doing the practicing on our way over to uh, before we headed off across the across the channel for the uh, for the D-Day flyover. Um, one of the one of the really great things about joining with the European uh, aircraft and the European squadron um, was uh, was was seeing how other people fly, how other people operate, and how pa passionate. Europeans are about uh, about this about the history of of the DC-3 C-47 um, and also and they and they have to be very passionate because uh, it's it's a lot of work to fly old uh, piston engine airplanes uh, throughout uh, in Europe so significantly more work than even than it is in the United States so the 5th of June this was the main event um, the main event was the 15 D-Day squadron airplanes, the nine European squadron airplanes, plus another dozen other World War II airplanes ranging from a couple Spitfires, a couple Mustangs, a few C-45s, T-6s. We all flew across the English Channel to, um, to drop mass, for a mass parachute drop over one of the original drop zones, a place called Sanervin. Uh, in Normandy. Um, and you can see we got kind of the money shot in the center there of all the parachute paratroopers going uh, going over. A um, couple interesting things. It was a it was the one of the largest formations of these types of of large aircraft that had been put together in England um, really since the war. Um, and we had some very, very patient and very dedicated paratroopers uh, flying with us. You can see the inside, every, the vast majority of whom were sitting on the floor in the aircraft, and it was an hour and a half long flight um, for everybody to sit there before we ended up, um, ended up in, Norm um, in Normandy. Um, we succeeded in, uh, in safely dropping over 200 paratroopers uh, over Centerville and recovering all the, the flight um, uh, the flight safely and um, without too much without too much event. The sixth of June, which is D-Day, was an interesting thing. It was all, it was it was a it was a bonus. When we had been planning this um, this operation, we had been told that the sixth of June, Normandy is crawling with VIPs, and that all of the airspace would be shut down. And that our opportunity to fly as civilians in that airspace would be shut down. So we had planned 
that that we would that we would use the sixth of June as a day to visit the sites. Um, about two weeks before the sixth of June, I was approached by the um, by the by the U.S. Air Force asking to see if we had some C-47s that would be interested in participating in the official wreath laying at Omaha Beach. I said, yes, I've got a couple C-47s. I've actually got 15. Can we all, can we all show, um, come? They said, sure. So we had the privilege and honor of being the only civilian aircraft airborne over Normandy on the 6th of June. Uh, we flew this formation that you can see in the right over President Trump and President Maxwell uh, during the official replay. I will say, as a as a mark of pride, we all, we flew with um, a whole bunch of um, other military teams, including the C-130s from um, the United States Air Force in Europe, a number of French um, French teams. We were the only group of aircraft on target within the allocated time frame. We, were, we had to be on target plus or minus 15 seconds, and we were on target within those within that time frame. All the other guys with the turbine aircraft and their GPSs and their uh, inertial navigation systems and so on and so forth, uh, they were either early or late. So I, 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 um, I'm very proud of that. Um, and I'm also very proud of, uh, of, of what the entire team the whole group of teams put together. You can see the top left picture there. That's a picture of one of our aircraft flying over um, the American Cemetery um, in Omaha Beach. There is there is no way to describe the how powerful that site is. The little white dots that you see under there. Each one of those is a grave is, is a grave marker. And it is one of the most solemn and most powerful things that I've ever done uh, in an aircraft. And I've done it several times now, and it still doesn't, uh, uh, it, um, it, it, it still pulls at, my, uh, pulls at my heartstrings, as I think as well it well should. Um, one of the things about flying um, on the 6th of June when the President of the United States is also flying on the 6th of June, is what we could do and where we could take off and land was highly restricted. So we ended up starting off very, very early in the morning, uh, getting searched by the Secret Service and um, being basically sequestered um, for the better part of the day until we were at, until Air Force One arrived. And then the president took off for the, uh, by a helicopter for the, um, for the ceremonies. And then we took off and joined up our flight. And um, we held for what turned out to be almost an hour, waiting for our turn for the flyby. Afterwards, we also, we were not allowed to land uh, in Caen, which is the, the name of the town, the airport we were based out of, until the president had come and gone, and gone with Air Force One. So we had a flight of 15 airplanes, a full tank of gas, no other civilian aircraft in the airspace, and basically, Called, um, a free pass to do whatever we wanted. And this was one of the most extraordinary, incredible things. Is we got our formation flew up and down the beaches of Normandy for another two hours waiting for Air Force One to come and go, including an impromptu flyover of Pegasus Bridge. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, it was one of the Pegasus Bridge was a bridge that was uh, secured uh, uh, by a um, uh, an elite group of British uh, commandos and with one of the most successful uh, airborne operations of World War II. It's extremely um, important historically to the Brits. Um, and um, and uh, just as they were having their commemoration there, uh, we took the D-Day squadron formation right across the Pegasus Bridge. And it was, uh, was uh, just another one of those little special things that, that we got to we got to participate in. You can see here's one of the C C-130s. They got into the uh, the USAFE C-130s. They got into the mix, and they uh, and there was that's all brother, and then they had uh, the hell yeah brother um, nose art on on their aircraft. 
I will say I would just have to give a shout out to the the USAFE guys um, who were the planners behind the um, uh, uh, behind the, the June sixth flyover. They um, they really made they they made it happen. And uh, if not for um, you know their dedication and their their uh, desire to to see something see this happen it would would never never happen. So we got to fly over Normandy on June the sixth. Drop paratroopers going across the English Channel. Would have already, of course, gone across the Atlantic, and we're getting ready to go back. But there was one other thing that that had almost was, was an afterthought um, from day one was the fact that it was the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. And the Berlin Airlift, of course, is a very different experience than uh, D-Day. D-Day was a wartime experience. It was a, it was aircraft that were 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 uh, were, were bringing in uh, soldiers to to carry out war. Um, just five years later, those same aircraft, those same flight crews, were um, participating in a humanitarian mission of feeding the city of Berlin. So we didn't know what to expect, but we had been invited. So, and we of course were doubly concerned about showing up with a whole bunch of D-Day painted aircraft in Germany. We went from uh, from Normandy to Wiesbaden, which is the um, uh, which was the uh, United States Air Forces in Europe headquarters during the time, and participate and were extraordinarily surprised by the welcome. We had 50 or 60,000 people come out to see our airplanes and to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. One of the things that, um, you know, people who are in their 70s, um, 70s and now 80s in Germany, they owe or they believe that their freedom their freedom from communism is largely due to the Allies' support during the Berlin Airlift. So it's an extraordinarily meaningful thing to the German people. Um, so again, very, very surprised that uh, at, at the welcome that we had. And but we had a special guest. We, we were put in touch with gentleman by the name of Colonel Gail Halverson. And Colonel Gail Halverson, uh, for those of you who might know, was the original candy bomber. A quick little, little background. Um, these U.S. air crews were bringing food into uh, um, into Berlin, and uh, there, were all, there were literally thousands of, of, of uh, starving children around the perimeter of the air, of the air base there. And uh, some of the airmen would started sharing their candy ration with the children. But of course, it wasn't very effective to get to just hand candy ration through the fence. So Gail Halverson uh, came up with the idea of creating parachutes or little packages and tying a parachute on it and throwing it out of the aircraft when they were um, on approach into, Temple, into Berlin's Tempelhof Airport. So that's what we did. Um, Jelly Belly Candies, um, very, very patriotic um, uh, company, produced 9,000 little parachute packages for us to drop over the children of Germany. And I was privileged to welcome Colonel Halverson as, one of, as our honorary crew member for this commemorative pan candy drop. And you can see a little picture of one of our aircraft Throwing, uh, throwing the parachutes and the candy um, out the out the door. So finally, the um, not finally, but the um, from from um, from Wiesbaden, we continued on to Berlin. Um, we we're a little bit disappointed. Our original plan had been to land at Berlin's Tempelhof Airport, which you can see in the um, in the picture on the bottom left there. But we brought the full D-Day squadron on a flight around Berlin and right over Berlin's Tempelhof Airport. Well, uh, Colonel Halverson was there with his, with you know, thousands of, of Berliners celebrating us 
and and um, and, and 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 again commemorating uh, the, this this humanitarian. You see a little video on the bottom there of us uh, flying over uh, flying over the Temple Hof Airport. Eric, while the video is playing, perhaps uh, could you tell us why you weren't able to land at Tempelhof? Is it still a functional airport? It is not a functional airport. Uh, well, let's put, it, it has everything that's that's supposed to be there. Um, but about uh, a number of years ago, Tempelhof was closed and turned into a park. Um, and uh, so all of the facilities are there, all the runways and hangar. There's actually a C-47 um, parked there. Um, so we would physically be able to land, but uh, but the, but the, the the local government in Berlin uh, did not uh, did not want us to land there. So we were we we're not given permission to, to to do that, which is a bit of a disappointment, both on the on the part of the uh, the German people, um, and um, and you know, and many many of our hosts. So, you know, the the um, uh, there was a bit of a uh, um, you know, kind of a political brouhaha that happened over the fact that we were not allowed to land in Berlin, um, where, you know, there's a, there's a very, it's a very powerful memory for, for people, um, especially people who, who lived in the former West Germany. Um, however, Berlin is in what used to be East Germany. Um, and the, the local government in Berlin is um, largely controlled by kind of former East Germans that have a little bit of a somewhat of a less uh, 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 charitable uh, view on this entire situation. So there was a political tension which we kind of got caught in the in the middle of. Um, it was very embarrassing for many German people to the extent where we would, after we left Berlin and we continued on our separate ways and kind of the squadron broke up, we would uh, land in different places in Germany and people would go out of their way to seek us out, to, um, to welcome us and to apologize for the, uh, for the actions of the Berlin government. Um, so it was really, uh, it was quite, quite interesting to, to, see that, uh, to see that happen. So, there's a picture of the D-Day squadron in front of Placid Lassie. Um, like I say, 15 airplanes. Each airplane had about five, you know, um, five people, five crew members at least. We really became kind of uh, a, a very close, close knit group, uh, kind of a happy family. We still correspond um, on kind of on a regular basis, and actually are, are still a functioning group um, as an organization. Uh, the D-Day squadron were. We're building ourselves into um, not only a, a you know kind of a, a the the, the uh, kind of getting the band back together, if you will, but also um, as a as a resource for continuing to operate C-47s um, as long as as long as possible. Um, you know, one of the other things is is um, just about our organization is that everybody worked extremely well together. Um, you know, if you've been kind of around the warbird world a little bit, you know, sometimes there's some rivalries, there's some sharp elbows, and um, and a lot of um, uh, um, you know people people who are very opinionated. The 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 D-Day squadron and the 75th the, this this trip to Europe really brought out the best in in every last one of uh, one of those teams. It was it was really extraordinary, and I think it's a really great uh, template for how we as a as an industry um as 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 the as the state keepers of, of this history um can 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 work very well together so after berlin the d-day squadron um kind of broke up and we all went our separate ways we just got a couple pictures here just to talk about some of the experiences we had because we were already in europe so we decided to do a little bit of sightseeing so we were welcomed to in a um, at a, um, a a family owned grass strip in Tannheim, right at the foothills of the Alps in Bavaria. Um, we actually got a chance to fly 
in uh, in front of Cinderella's castle. Uh, the the um, that's Neuschwanstein, which is the the the, the castle that um, that that um, they say that Disney used to um, um, to as as a uh, as a template for 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 Cinderella's castle. We got to fly last week up in front there. Uh, we participated in a couple impromptu air shows, including one with uh, Matthias Dolderer, with the um, reigning air, Red Bull Air Race champion. Uh, we continued on to Venice, and uh, we were welcomed there by a uh, local flying club and got the opportunity to fly over Venice and around Venice. The interesting thing about Venice is that there's a place, the uh, right adjacent or right across the uh, the bay uh, from from Venice itself is, a, is an island called Lido. And on that island is a grass airstrip that dates back into the 1930s. And it was one of the first commercial airstrips in Italy. So we got to uh, land there with the DC-3s and, and we were welcomed by the entire, by that entire group of, of people. And we continued back going north. We got an opportunity to fly across the Alps. Uh, one of the uh, one of the teams that came from Switzerland in, uh, invited us to come along, and they wanted to show us the Alps together. So we flew a formation flight, so you can see around the Matterhorn, um, and and uh, and over uh, the glacier that comes off the Matterhorn there. And finally, we made it home. Fifteen aircraft, uh, six of which were D-Day uh, veterans, flew over 150,000 miles, almost 1,500 hours. We're on the road for seven weeks, which is a long time. Uh, only seems uh, that seemed like a really long time, but now sitting here at home in uh, yeah, in uh, in quarantine, it seems maybe that wasn't such a long time at this point in time. Uh, but you can read the rest of the numbers here. It was really you know we went through a hundred thousand gallons of fuel, uh, six hundred eighty-three gallons of aviation fuel, uh, sorry, of, of, of aviation oil. Uh, one thing, just talk about the fuel. Um, the most we paid for fuel was almost $15 a gallon for aviation fuel in our Sarswak in Greenland. Um, interesting thing is that every drop of fuel that we consumed in Germany was donated by Total, the, the, the German fuel um, a, a petroleum company, as a thank you for us bringing the airplanes to commemorate the, the Berlin airlift. Um, let's see, 5,000 pounds of jelly bellies <laughs> and five days parachute operations. Uh, it was, uh, was an extraordinary event, an extraordinary experience, and, uh, one that, uh, that will live with me for, for, for the rest of my life. And, uh, and I'm now already starting, to, we're already starting to hatch plans to go back to Europe for, for the 80th anniversary. So that's the story. Um, at least in a nutshell, and um, and you know it, it was really true, well and truly an honor to to participate and to really bring the stories of Lassie, of the rest of the aircraft um, to to the world, and and not and 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 um, um, and share the story, share those stories with. Not only the the generation that we're losing so quickly, but new generations who really are the ones that need to uh, pick up and carry the torch uh, uh, for years to come. So that's well, pretty thank much. Thank you, thank you, Eric. That's that's a, an amazing look into uh, the operations of the D-Day squadron and and what it took this this Herculean effort to get all these airplanes over to France. Um, if you're ready for it, uh, I've got a list of questions here that folks have been submitting throughout the course of the presentation. Uh, those sure. of you that uh, haven't yet asked your question, please do enter it into the question window now, and uh, I will pose them to Eric uh, approximately in order. So, Eric, if you're ready. Go right ahead. So the first question we've got here is, were you able to have actual veterans of the D-Day invasion participate as jumpers in any of the commemorative parachute drops that you did uh, for the 75th anniversary? So we did not have any um, um, any veterans, any D-Day veterans uh, jump with us. There were, uh, there were a couple individuals who had wanted to do so, but their health was not such that they could do so. We did have... Uh, um, 
Lieutenant Colonel Dave Hamilton, uh, who is, is the last surviving Pathfinder pilot, um, traveled with us and flew with us across the channel. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Pathfinders were the the highly the, the, the specially trained elite C-47 crews that that uh, dropped the first um, first paratroopers in that were setting that were tasked with setting up the radio beacons to guide the remaining aircraft um, over Normandy. Uh, so uh, that was quite quite the privilege to have him um, uh, participate with us. No doubt. Um, did you guys uh, have to take any special steps to configure the aircraft for jumpers? Um, I I know from my past experience that uh, one of the things that's most difficult to find in a C-47 restoration is uh, the bucket seats for parachutists. So uh, that obviously explains why a large contingent of paratroopers had to sit on the floor. But can you maybe talk about some of the other specialist equipment? Yeah, so the, the 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 most important thing for a um, for C forty seven to to jump is the is the what's called the anchor line, which is that cable that goes across the top of the uh, or goes longitudinally down the top of the uh, the aircraft. So of course every aircraft needed to have an anchor line. Um, fortunately, most of the airplanes um, did either have the jump seats or um, or they were cargo aircraft and we just had the floor for everybody to everybody to sit on. Um, there were a number of the aircraft that were not configured for jumping, and they just uh, they just they, they they flew along with us uh, there. The um, the other things, kind of from a from a jump standpoint, um, is um, of course you have to have the door. Uh, you know the aircraft were originally built with the door that 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 opens up in flight, and then a methodology of communication between the jump master or the load master and and the flight crew. And depending upon the aircraft, some aircraft have um, just communication, and and others have uh, the, um, the 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 typical um, you know red light, green light um, to let the uh, let the jumpers know when to uh, stand up, hook up, and go out the door. Okay. Um, can you maybe also expound upon that to talk about any specialized equipment that had to be fitted for the crossing? Uh, did you guys have to put additional fuel tanks in the airplanes? So we did not, interestingly. Um, the original C-47s have about eight hours of fuel. Um, and um, so the, uh, the, you know, we were able to have enough fuel to be able to follow the original route. Uh, Placid Lassie did have extra fuel tanks fitted and we did that because when we we learned our lesson in 2014 uh that the weather in Narsarswak is very very much unpredictable the fuel is very expensive there and as as a as a way to give us more operational flexibility we put another 500 gallons in um in uh, in ferry tanks inside the inside of Placid Lassie so our our Atlantic crossing uh was actually from Goose Bay straight to um uh, Reykjavik, which is about a 10 and a half hour leg, um, which is a long time to be sitting in an airplane with no soundproofing, no heat, uh, and not a lot of cre not a lot of creature comforts. We spent a lot of time uh, napping and looking out the window, uh, contemplating the icebergs on the water <laughs> down below us. Um, but most of the other airplanes did not uh, did not have auxiliary tanks. You know the navigation. You know every airplane had um, installed. You know what the latest navigation available. You know you know GPS, and um, the other thing is uh, long range uh, radio communication, high frequency radios, which we all had to have, which is a a, a both a practical and a regulatory requirement, so that you can communicate with air traffic control. Interestingly, though, HF ra radios are notoriously unreliable. Because they rely on uh, bouncing radio waves over the ionosphere, so we ended up doing most of our communications with air traffic control um, uh, via relay. So when we had the airplanes, as I mentioned earlier, we would we'd split the split the flights up, and each airplane was about an hour and a half behind the other one, the previous one. So the first airplane would be called would would go beyond the range of regular VHF communication. What they would do in order to communicate with air traffic control is they would call the other the, the subsequent D-Day squadron aircraft and ask them to relay 
um, the position reports. And that we we basically did that all the way through the entire flight, all the way back to the last airplanes. And then we reversed that once the first airplanes got back into radio uh, radio contact. The later airplanes that were not in radio contact, um, uh, you know, leapfrogged and relayed the uh, relayed the communication. It was pretty neat. Uh, it worked very, very well, and it was also a nice way to uh, to kind of communicate with everyone and really work together as a work together as a team. Okay, we've got a couple of questions here that I think are driving at the same thing, which is weather. Um, a couple of folks would like to know um, how the winds were coming back when they were working against you, um, and I think if you could also offer a more general comment on whether or not your planned operations were adversely impacted by weather throughout the course of the uh, D-Day squadron mission to Normandy. Sure. Um, so uh, the weather was, as I as I mentioned earlier, probably the biggest our biggest single challenge that we couldn't control. You know, the mechanical. You know, we could control largely by making sure that the airplanes were were um, were um, you know, we're in the best condition possible. But yeah, so going across the Atlantic, um, about half the squadron got stuck in Goose Bay for a couple of days, uh, waiting for the weather to improve. Um, and I can I can vouch for the fact that Goose Bay is not a place that you really want to spend any more time than you have to. Uh, there's not very much there at all. Um, the interestingly, the winds on the way back. Um, you know, typically, you know, we always think of the North Atlantic as being kind of a, a west to east flow of, of wind, and that is uh, generally the case with airliners at higher altitude. But at lower altitude, um, the 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 winds are a lot more changeable, and they're a lot more affected by low altitude weather. So we actually had a um, uh, going eastbound, we had uh, um, uh, a reasonable amount of headwinds. Uh, throughout the flight because there was a, a very strong low pressure um, system in the central Atlantic and the the airflow around the low pressure is counterclockwise so it actually ended up with a with a headwind and um, and we got lucky on the way back um, at least when we flew back uh, where we had a slight a slight tailwind uh, coming back um, uh, across the um, across the, the Atlantic again we had we had the luxury of being able to wait um you know until the winds were um were favorable for the for the flight um you know in in wartime aircraft didn't have the luxury to do that um you know the idea was that the airplanes had to get of course get to get to england to participate in the war and also the the various stopping off points uh that the aircraft stopped only had a limited amount of space for aircraft and for flight crews so they 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 had to get the the crews you know, land, refuel, and back out on their on their way, because otherwise they would uh, they would run out of space in in Narsarswak or even in in, in Reykjavik. Um, Eric, I know early on there actually, was sorry, there was a the concern last... for modern operations wise. There was a concern there might not be enough hundred low lead in the ground in Narsarswak. Um, can you talk about whether or not it was necessary to make arrangements to have a the stockpile there? Um, and in addition to that. Was there a need to have, you know, a QEC engine on an airplane ready to go somewhere, or uh, to pre-stage parts in Europe or anything like that? Yeah. So, um, so um, go, um, we did pre-purchase the fuel in Narsarswak to make sure that we would have fuel, we would have enough fuel for our uh, for our aircraft. Um, the 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 important. So that that also got us a, a little bit of a, of a discount on the price. Uh, the big issue with going through Narsarswak and the big concern was the amount of time they only have one fuel truck there, and so the fuel truck each time you fu uh, fuel the C forty seven, you would um, um, uh, empty the fuel truck, and then the fuel truck had to go back to the fuel farm, fill up the fuel truck, wait thirty minutes for the fuel to settle. And then pump into the next aircraft. So our biggest concern was both the timing on that, but in the fact that there was a single point of failure of if that fuel truck stopped working, and indeed it did stop working um, on the way back. Again, there was less of a time constraint, so we were able to to um, to spread things out a little bit. But the fuel truck broke, 
So fuel in Narsarsawak on, on our way back to the States was pumped out of 55 gallon drums uh, with a little electric pump. And uh, the interesting thing is when you have fuel that is pumped out of drums, you don't buy fuel by the gallon, you buy fuel by the barrel. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very different, <laughs> different way of, uh, way, way of doing things. Um, but yeah, we had to, um, we had to make sure that we have to have the fuel. The, the, the spare parts logistics, you know, we're, we're, there was a lot of, um, a lot of planning that went into this and a lot of, of, uh, of thought that went into, um, you know, what it is that we needed to have or wanted to have. And we ended up settling on trying to have each and every airplane be as self-sufficient as possible in terms of um, spare parts. And the idea being that you could, you could uh, pre-stage spare parts in one particular spot, but if that is not where your airplane happens to break, if your airplane diverted or gets delayed or something of that sort, um, if that's not uh, where the parts are, then you're, you, know, you might as well just not have the parts. So we had a combination of, of encouraging all the aircraft to, to carry a, a very comprehensive package of spares. And then we also had a, um, um, a, the use of a King Air donated to us um, uh, by the folks over at Dynamic Aviation, and that was their support aircraft. So if we ever ended up into a problem or we needed to move people or, or tools back and forth, we had that we had that option. We never we never had we never had to use it, um, but that was um, uh, that option was there. Uh, the other thing is the the only place where it would have been very difficult to get a, an, an engine shipped in short order would actually was actually in Greenland itself. Um, you know, um, you know your 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 FedExes and your UPSs will ship to Goose Bay and they'll ship to uh, Reykjavik, and then once you're in England, there is a small but very active group of C-47s and DC-3s that operate in England. So pretty much anything that you needed uh, once you're over in Europe was was already available there. But we also got really lucky. <laughs> we, we, we had very few uh, major mechanical, uh, very, uh, you know, mechanical issues. I think that uh, comes as something of a surprise to everyone. I think there was a quite a healthy amount of skepticism about how the airplanes mechanically would hold up on what is the, the longest journey of their more recent lives. Um, Eric, we've had a bunch of questions come in about the altitude at which you cross the ocean. Um, could you perhaps address that, but also what is the service ceiling on the C-47? And if that you know limit truly applies in modern times, or if it really is the uh, comfort ceiling from the perspective of the pilot that dictates that altitude. Yeah, so so okay, to answer the first question, most of the flying across the Atlantic was done somewhere between five and ten thousand feet, uh, which you know by comparison, you know an airliner is going to be up in the thirty five thousand foot range. Um, depending upon um, and in two thousand fourteen, we actually flew a portion of our flight at fifteen hundred feet, the idea being to get the airplane down to an altitude where the air was warm enough so we didn't pick up any uh, airframe ice. Um, and then we were up as high as uh, 13,000 feet for a short period of time uh, in 2014. The, the public service ceiling on the on this, uh, DC-3 is, I think, somewhere in the 20, 22,000 foot uh, range. Um, that's rarely, if ever, used. Uh, in any sort of the operations for two reasons. One is it gets really cold up there. And as I mentioned earlier, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of heat on the airplanes. And, um, and also above 10,000 feet, you need to start breathing supplemental oxygen. So um, that limits, you know, all of the aircraft carried supplemental oxygen just in case, but you know, there's a, you have a limited, you're, you're breathing out of a bottle. So you have a limited amount of time uh, that you can be on, be on the oxygen. The other thing is that the in in with at the weights that we were flying the airplane with a lot of fuel and parts and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and with the kind of the um, uh, you know maybe a little bit less less performance than maybe have happened when the airplanes were completely new, is that if you were to lose an engine, 
the airplane really will only maintain somewhere between 11 and 13,000 feet. So it's called 12,000 feet. And, and that was a big concern for crossing the Greenland ice cap. A uh, number of the airplanes, because of the weather, um, chose instead of going through Narsarswak to actually go up to uh, uh, Sondestrom, which is up in further north in, 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 uh, in Greenland. But as you go out of Sondestrom, you have to cross, uh, cross the Greenland ice cap and the minimum and route altitudes there are well in excess of 10,000 feet. So you got into the situation where if you were to lose an engine, the airplane might not be able to maintain altitude to stay above the ice cap, which is not a, a very, uh, uh, not, a, not, not, a, not a good place to be. So, you know, generally we tried to stay over the water where we had the option to, to, to really pick and choose our altitudes based upon what the weather. Um, you know, the, the, the outside air temperature and the icing. I think that more than sufficiently answers that question. Um, we talked a little bit about how the Germans responded to the effort to kind of commemorate the Berlin airlift. Can you talk a little bit about how the French received this flight of American airplanes commemorating D-Day and, and perhaps more generally about how the French um, relate to the sacrifices made on their behalf by American, British, and Canadian servicemen who went ashore at, at Normandy. Yeah, um, I, 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 I forgot that I, I didn't, didn't really, I kind of almost took it for granted. Um, the 6th of June in Normandy, in France, is a festival. It is a, a celebration of all things American. It's a celebration of, um, of, 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 of gratitude. It's a celebration of history. Um, it is really, um, you know, the, the, the French, especially in that part of France, are, are awed um, by the sacrifices um, made, uh, you know, by the, by the American, British, and Canadian, Canadian forces. And it is something that they respect and that they honor uh, each and every uh, each and every June the sixth. You know, we, you know, we went over for the seventy fifth anniversary, which was, you know, of course, a very powerful and very meaningful, uh, you know, big big anniversary. But it's important to remember that in France, every June sixth, there is a massive celebration and massive amounts of remembrance throughout the. Um, Throughout Normandy, the Cotonou uh, uh, Peninsula, and um, and you know this just happened to be one of the bigger <laughs> one of the bigger uh, um, uh, bigger anniversaries, um, and and it's and the, the entire the entire area is 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 kind of overrun um, with uh, with uh, um, reenactors um, people. Um, you know, tourists and, and people coming to coming to remember. Um, and and the interesting thing is, it's not just June the sixth. Um, people, um, and if you ever have, you know, I, I really strongly encourage anyone if they ever have the opportunity to visit Normandy um, at any time, um, and especially these sites, if if you have an appreciation for the history, it's one of the most powerful things that you'll ever that you'll ever do in your life. And it is it is a um, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very, um, it, it not only is very powerful, but you really understand the gratitude that the French people have. And I know one of the planning complexities, Eric, was bringing American airplanes, piston engine, you know, vintage World War II aircraft into the sort of stringent requirements of air traffic control and airworthiness and everything in the European Union. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not special exemptions were needed or were the airplanes just freely able to visit? So generally, we're, there, were, there were no special exemptions that needed. I mean, well, actually, uh, 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 let, uh, let me rephrase that. By and large, we were able to operate. However, you know, the aircraft had to be equipped, um, uh, you know, appropriately with the correct radios and, and, and transponders, actually the same ADSB systems that, uh, that aircraft now have to have throughout the United States. Um, so that was the equipage, the, the equipment was, was actually fairly straightforward. 
the biggest hurdle for us to operate in Europe was insurance. Um, the EU requires in aircraft insurance based upon the weight of the aircraft. So uh, in the case of a C-47, that's about $40 million of liability insurance. And by way of comparison, most you know uh, air, airplanes um, like the C-47 operating in the United States maybe have $5 million of liability insurance. So the biggest challenge operating within Europe for, for us was to be able to get that in, get that insurance at a at an affordable um, at an affordable rate. All that having been said, flying in Europe is a very, very different thing than we have in the United States. The freedom the, 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 that we have to fly um, kind of where and when we please in most places in the United States is just something that does not exist in Europe. Um, and if you ever, for those of you who are pilots out there, if you ever had any question as to whether or not to support AOPA and, and, and the other various lobbying groups to preserve our freedom to fly, um, you just go to Europe and go to fly, fly in Europe for, for a couple of days. Um, and, and you'll understand it, how difficult it is and how uh, restrictive it is from an airspace standpoint, from an airfield access standpoint. You know, in the United States, I mean, you know, the tower may be closed, but, you know, by and large, every airport that's out there, most airports that are out there are open all the time. And you can come and go as you please. In Europe, if the tower is closed, if the airport is closed, the the um, um, you the airport is closed and you just can't you can't go there. Um, and it's it's really a, a very much an eye opener as to you know kind of what the world could become like in in, in the United States. Okay. Um... You guys made the 75th anniversary of D-Day, the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. Was thought given to staying in Europe long enough for the 75th anniversary of Market Garden, which would have been a little later in the year? We did we did um, consider that, um, and we would have really liked to participate. The big challenge was um, Market Garden is, is middle of September, and um, at that point in time, the weather across the North Atlantic starts deteriorating. Uh, pretty uh, pretty quickly and it becomes even more unpredictable. So, um, you know, every airplane was free to stay if they so chose, but uh, we basically decided um, that we needed to kind of get out of Dodge and get back across the Atlantic before the weather got bad. We, um, we stayed in 2014 through Market Garden and the weather was, uh, you know, we almost didn't make it back to the States. Uh, when I say almost didn't make it back, it's not like we were going to have something bad happen. We just might have gotten stuck somewhere um, inopportune across the North Atlantic. Okay. Um, last couple questions here as we draw this evening to a close. Um, where was Placid Lassie built? Uh, <laughs> Placid Lassie was built in, um, in Southern California um, at the Douglas plant. Um, there, actually, most of her was was built there. Uh, the tail section was built in um, uh, in Texas um, as they kind of ramped up to um, to build uh, uh, build the C-47s. They started building various components in in different parts of the uh, uh, other parts of the country. But the Santa Monica, California, is where uh, Lassie was built. Okay, and the last question for this evening uh, is a little bit biased, but it's come from a couple of our volunteers here at the museum. Will you bring Placid Lassie to Warbirds Over the Beach in October? <laughs> you put me on the spot there, huh? Well, you um, know, I, all, I, would, I would I would very much like to do so. Um, honestly, the you know Lassie lives in uh, Schenectady, New York, right now, and. Uh, if if it works with our schedule, um, we will uh, um, we, we will definitely uh, de uh, definitely do our best to make it to the uh, to the warbirds over the beach. Well, I think we'd uh, we'd certainly love to host you and the airplane and your whole crew down here. And uh, I know there are many more volunteers uh, listening to this webinar who'd love to pick your brain at some length about 
um, the, the crossing to Normandy and plans for the 80th anniversary. We've had a couple questions asked on that front. But uh, Eric, thank you very much for being with us this evening. We won't take up a bunch more of your time. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And uh, we hope you'll you know, join us and listen in a few, a few of the other webinars we have planned. So thank you, Eric. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.